Good morning, a warm and cordial, very sincere welcome from our Peace Memorial, or our, I keep calling it Peace Memorial, Avondale Memorial Church. You're very welcome here. We don't have very many people. Our numbers are very few, but it could be that we have a lot of people listening and watching. We welcome you especially if you're at home or if you're at uh, Avondale House or the Lodge or even if you're overseas somewhere, we welcome you very much. It's good to see you here. Um, I welcome the people who are going to be our uh, singers. We have uh, Rosalie and uh, Robina are going to sing. We have, um, yeah, we've got pianist and organist Joy and uh, Linda. Yeah, and uh, Pastor uh, uh, Lionel Hughes is going to conduct the prayer. And we have a special uh, lesson this morning. We have our doctor. Yeah, pardon me, I keep forgetting numbers, but yeah. And she's going to conduct the, the lesson, and uh, it's quite a good lesson. And I noticed that somewhere right near the end of it, it says somewhere that you must ask somebody to, to read a poem. I didn't like the poem all that much, so I've got my own poem to read. Not my poem, but one I've learned a long time ago. It's a special one I have for you this morning. I never came to you, my friend, and went away without some new enrichment of the heart, more faith and less of doubt, more courage for the days ahead, and coming to you in need, I went away comforted indeed. How can I find the shining word, the glowing phrase that tells all that your love has meant to me, all that your friendship spells? There is no word, no phrase. On you I can depend, on whom I can depend. Coming to you, I must just say, God bless you, precious friend. That's all I can say. God bless all the precious friends that we have all around us. And uh, I d should have mentioned that uh, David Pudney is going to play a piano special item too. That's all our program for today. May it be a special time for you, a time of enrichment and a time for everyone. God bless you. Our worshiping song this morning begins with take time to be holy. In this song, there are several phrases which jumped out at me when I was reading it through. Speak oft with your Lord. Spend much time in secret. Abide in him always. By looking to Jesus, we will be like, like him we shall be and let him be our guide. It's such wise counsel, words we can carry with us each and every day, whether in good times or bad. Let's sing.
heart of God. What an incredible place to be, so close to him. He holds us up when we come close to him. This is encouragement for us in times that challenge us and indeed in our walk every day. ago the world was shocked. You were shocked as you saw an airliner crash into the World Trade Center in New York. Following the disastrous collapse of the Twin Towers, American churches were filled for a while with people confused and fearful for the future. Jesus predicted worldwide calamity and terror, but he also promised peace and rest for those who trust in him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks because you are good. Your love is eternal. Like the psalmist, we can affirm, in my distress I called to the Lord. He answered me and set me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? He is the Lord that helps me. You helped the little boy, AJ, who was lost this week, and he was found safe and well. How his parents rejoiced and praised your name. Protect us from harm and evil, from the virus, from the attacks of the evil one, from terrorist plots that destroy towers. You are the Lord who helps us. As the psalmist continues, it is better to trust in the Lord than to depend on humans. We live in perilous times of natural disasters and man-made conflict, all foretold by Jesus, who is our only hope. May we share with others the good news, the everlasting gospel that you promised would go to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. May our personal faith overflow as we share with others, with others the message of the three angels of Revelation 14. As your worldwide church has been considering the end time messages this week, give us a spirit of unity and a sense of urgency to fear God and give him glory and worship our creator and redeemer. May we learn from the ancient Israelites who failed to find rest in the promised land. 
you worked miracles for them, fed them with manna for 40 years, and yet they all perished in the wilderness of unbelief. May we trust in you and find true peace and rest. Be with us as we support by our offerings and prayers your mission of grace to the whole world. Forgive us for failing to trust you more. Bless us on this Sabbath day as we listen to the messages of hope and salvation. We pray in your wonderful name. Amen. Hello brothers and sisters. In this video report, we would like to demonstrate some of the amazing things that Ad Australia has been able to do in the Australian Union Conference territory and internationally. As the humanitarian and development arm of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ad's purpose is to serve humanity so all may live as God intended. We want to see a world free of poverty and advantage where everyone can thrive. This means that our work is to equip and empower families and communities to engage in livelihood, health and education programs that help them move out of poverty and hardship and in times of disaster to respond to those in need. As you know, we serve people around the world and right here in Australia. From 2015 to 2020, together with the help of our supporters and partners, we reached over 2.5 million people through our development and humanitarian initiatives. These projects have assisted families and communities in Asia, Africa, the South Pacific and Australia through a wide range of activities. We have partnered with communities to build water systems and sanitation facilities. We have equipped families to grow nutrition food crops, mums and dads to run small businesses, and girls and women to be protected from domestic violence. During this time, we have responded to natural disasters in countries including Fiji, Tonga, Vanuatu, Haiti, India, Papua New Guinea, the Philippines, Nepal, and Kenya. Several disasters have arisen due to conflict or health crisis, and EDRA has responded in countries including Bangladesh, Lebanon, DRC, and Rwanda. All these responses have been in partnership with our in-country EDRA partners and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Right here in Australia, we have also served families through our national program. Together with our church, we help identify specific community needs and then design and implement a program that best fulfills those needs. Across Australia, over 110 programs were implemented involving initiatives like food pantries, counseling services, and op shops. These projects have been very crucial in helping support the community in times of disaster. Our national program has responded to the Australian drought, bushfires, floods, and more recently, the COVID-19 pandemic. In response to COVID-19, churches were activated as essential services. As Australians were impacted by the economic downturn, the demand for address support increased. Our national programs were providing takeaway meals, crisis food hampers, and phone counseling. Our national programs have reached thousands in need and helped our churches to connect with their communities in a meaningful and practical way, sharing the gospel of Jesus. This would not have been possible without a strong partnership between EDRA and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Together, we are stronger and can serve more people. Looking to the future, under God's guidance, we are certain that we'll continue to bring love and compassion to many others. We're excited to be embarking on a new journey with the Alliance of Edra Australia and Edra New Zealand. We look forward to being able to increase our impact and show God's love to more people. We truly believe that we are stronger together. 
Edra Australia will also continue to work very closely with our Edra partners to assist the most vulnerable around the world. It has been an absolute privilege to serve our community as part of the Australian Union Conference. Thank you and God bless. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency, or ADRA, is the global humanitarian arm of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're a team of more than 10,000 dedicated humanitarians in more than 100 countries who serve the world's most vulnerable people every day. For decades, ADRA has responded to some of the world's most devastating disasters and crises, but nothing could have prepared us for this global pandemic. COVID-19 forced us to rethink and redesign the way we would face this new crisis. ADRA established a task force and put together a strategy to serve vulnerable people around the world. We created 422 projects to serve 20 million people in 96 countries. ADRA pivoted to meet needs around the world with the help of our generous supporters and partners. Our response has grown to over $26 million. That would not have been possible without the support of partnerships with the Adventist Church, governments, United Nations agencies, corporations, non-profit organisations, and of course, our incredible supporters. For every $1 that ADRA invested, our partners contributed seven. Our work with the church in particular has been very successful. Nearly 70% of all COVID-19 response projects were in partnership with our church. Adventists around the world came together to support the mission of ADRA. They came together in solidarity for those who are suffering and for those who continue to suffer, so all may live as God intended. Thanks to our partnership with the Adventist Church and other agents of change, ADRA is working around the clock to counteract the fallout from the pandemic. For years, ADRA has helped communities stay healthy because we understand that when health is affected, not much else matters. This is why we have been supporting health projects around the globe to ensure people are not made more vulnerable from sickness. Ensuring that families remain healthy has never been more important than right now. Our responses included 97 health projects, helping more than 5 million people around the world. Our partnership with Adventist-led health facilities has reached many in need. During this response, ADRA delivered tons of personal protective equipment supplies to hospitals and healthcare centres so that health workers and patients alike could be protected. In partnership with Adventist broadcasters, ADRA also sent out critically important health messages to millions of people to ensure that hand washing and proper precautions were taken to reduce the spread of the virus. ADRA also understands that water and sanitation are critical in times of need and do more than almost anything to prevent the spread of the virus. Because of this, ADRA has been hard at work to ensure people around the globe have access to hand washing stations, cleaning alcohol and proper training of sanitation protocols. This year, our COVID task force has tailored 89 projects to address the needs of water and sanitation. More than 4 million people have access to these projects. Few fallouts of any crisis, however, can match the desperation of global hunger. As markets collapsed, economies crumbled and millions lost their jobs, food became harder and harder to find and afford. Families who'd never experienced hunger waited in lines at food banks and distribution centres. Children missed meals, many felt the pains of not only hunger, but also hopelessness. For these reasons, ADRA spent $8.5 million to ensure that vulnerable families around the world would not go hungry. Our COVID task force implemented 134 projects to feed more than 6 million people around the world. During these times of instability and confusion, support systems break down, mental health suffers, and individuals feel isolated and lonely. With 58 of our COVID-19 projects being designed to provide psychosocial support, we've connected with 2.6 million people and they now know they're not alone. The 422 COVID-19 projects have supported 20 million people and this example has given hope to millions more. As ADRA's response grows, our focus will expand to help communities recover from the long-term effects of this pandemic, aiming towards areas of resilience, rebuilding livelihoods and education for all. The global effects of COVID-19 are unprecedented, but thanks to the partnership with the Adventist Church, we've been able to make a big difference. Our church and our supporters have enabled us to continue serving and being the hands and feet of Jesus. This wouldn't have been possible without you. 
Thank you. At this time, we take up an offering, <clears throat> or we would have taken up an offering had there been the people in our church. But um, it's necessary nowadays to just put it in, a, in a, an envelope and keep it for the time when you will be able to give it. And we praise God for the good efforts that Adra has done. It's an, an inspiring talk that they've given this morning. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the wisdom that constructed an organization that is able to help, to bring encouragement and help, to bring money and, and to help those people in such a marvelous way. We thank you for ADRA and for what it means to our organization. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that we may give of our means at all times to assist and make sure that this work is able to continue. We pray this, please, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
Thank you, David, for that very beautiful piece of music that certainly transported me to another place, far away from worry and care. Let's just bow our heads as we invite God's presence to be with us during the study of the lesson. Heavenly Father, thank you for this quiet place. Thank you for the peace and the rest that you give us so graciously. And I pray that you will open our eyes, Lord, our spiritual eyes this morning so that we can gain insight into your grace, your salvation, and into that perfect rest that you offer us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning to everybody who is here, and that I can count basically on one and a half hands. To those of you who may be in isolation and who are longing for human company, for those of you who are going through difficult physical, emotional, psychological, or spiritual crises, today we are here for you, and God's message is for you, so welcome. When I had a look at the title of the lesson for this week, I thought that it was going to be about experiences that different characters in the Bible may have had in terms of finding rest in God. I thought it was going to be a soft, gentle lesson. As I delved deeper, however, I found out that it was a little bit difficult at first to find the link between longing for more and the content of the lesson. And I like that because it causes a little brow frown and it causes us to think. And I'd like to contextualize the lesson this morning, first of all, with this verse from the Bible. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. It's an interesting text. We're talking about them in the past and about us and about the culmination of the ages. So let's delve a little deeper. We're certainly looking at the idea, the concept of rest from an historical perspective this week. And I did a little bit of reading research and found this statement that really helped me to initially begin to understand why is it important that we look back in Bible history to what happened to the children of Israel back to creation. Why can't we look forward? And this is what I found from William Patterson University in the United States. History provides us with a sense of identity. History provides us with a sense of identity. And as the spiritual children of Israel, this is the context that we begin with. We are the children of God, and so were the children of Israel. And history provides us with a sense of spiritual identity. So let's look further, let's delve further. Longing, longing for more. And there are two fundamental questions that we need to ask right now. Number one, what is the more that is referred to in the title of the lesson? More of what? And number two, who is doing the longing? Longing for more. So let's look at that first question, more of what? And if you're at home and you have family there with you, you might like to discuss this. Do we want more understanding of the Bible, of ourselves, of what is happening in the world around us? Do we want more insight, going deep into that understanding? Do we want more rest? Do we want more faith, more trust 
more peace, more money, more time? What do we want more of? It's an interesting question. And the second question is, who is doing the longing? When you sit in peace, as we were just a minute ago and listening to that beautiful music, There is a Quiet Place, it made me feel a sense of, of longing for more. Longing for deeper conversation with God. Longing for heaven and home. And what about you? What are you longing for? Longing has been described by the Cambridge Dictionary as a feeling of wanting something or someone very much. And as I did a little bit of reading into this week's lesson, I came across an article that was written by Andy Tix, Dr. Andy Tix. And the article in Psychology Today was called Longing for more. And I thought, well, this is a meant to be. And there is a German concept that he used as the basis, the focus of his article, and it is the, the concept Sehnsucht. Sehnsucht. And there is no English equivalent of that one word, but it means this. Sehnsucht is an intense desire for something beyond our human capacity to fulfill. It is a sense that something is missing, something that, if fulfilled, would make everything complete. Sehnsucht, a concept, something we desire that is beyond our human capacity to fulfill. And that's a beautiful segue into this idea of rest in God. We find that in Psalm 145, we have these words. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. If you are confronting something that is causing you great anxiety and fear, the Lord is near to you. If you desire just peace, the Lord is near to you. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and he will save them. The Lord keeps all who love him. I can't help but think of the thief on the cross. Jesus, remember me. He saw the divinity in God, and he saw the possibility of rest, and he called on Jesus, remember me. Remember me. Is that the desire of our heart, the Zizucht? And this is a very lovely quote from a book that um, was written by um, Ms. Kay, and it is a book about finding healing for your hurt. And this is what she wrote. Note to self, I will rest in the Lord and will wait patiently for him I'm not in control, but I am loved and held by the one who is. Now, why am I giving you these quotes and exploring these quotes? We have a longing for more. What that more might be is something that is individual and specific to each of us. Sometimes we have a longing for more and we don't even know what that more is. It may be a spiritual longing for more, for something we have not experienced before. And God knows and he reads our need. 
But it isn't only you and me and humanity that have a longing for more. And this takes us right back to the beginning of our history. In Isaiah 30, verse 18, we read this. I, I love this verse. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. God, the Lord, the Godhead in its three, has a longing to be gracious to us, to give his grace to us. So it isn't only us who long for more. God himself longs for more. He longs for more time together. He longs for you and me to grasp the gift of salvation. God also longs for more. And that, during the week, um, was an insight that I really thought carefully about. This idea of rest and waiting on the Lord, it's not a one-way thing. It is a two-way thing. God longs to pour out his gifts upon us, the gift of life, he longs to give us the gift of rest and the gift of peace. But sometimes our hands are so full of worry, of care, that we are unable to grasp the gift, to place our hand in God's hand. And this takes us now to the question. We are studying about rest and longing for more. So why are we taking this walk through history? Why? Why are we looking back at the Exodus and the mistakes that the children of Israel made and the effort and trust and faith that Moses had to place in God? Why, why are we looking at this? Well, of all people, George Orwell, who wrote 1984, Big Brother is Watching You, and Animal Farm, he said this, the most effective way to destroy people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history. And if I were to apply that to the spiritual world and to the world of our spiritual identity as children of God, just like the children of Israel, the most effective way to destroy the people of God is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their creation, their salvation, and their history in God. So this brings us a little closer to linking the title of this week's lesson with the actual content and if we look at the four, five days of study, we find this, that we're longing for more, and I've got that in blue so that you are reminded this is what it's about, longing for more. And it is a transcendent, um, it, it, is, it is transcendent, a, a reforming kind of longing that goes way beyond human control, and it goes to the transcendence of us linking with God through the gift of Jesus. Baptised into Moses, rituals and sacrifices, harden not your hearts, the example of rest and conquering heaven, heavenly city. And we look at that and we think, wow, longing for more? What does all this mean? Well, it means we have a context. Let's look at this idea of the children of Israel being baptised into Moses. Now the context is, is this, the children of Israel were in bondage, they were in captivity in Egypt and God provided a way of escape. He anointed Moses to be his representative and the leader of Israel 
And if we have a look at Moses and I said to you, what can you tell me about Moses? You'd probably tell, well, he, he, his life was under threat, so his mother made a little basket, waterproof basket, put him in the, in the reeds, in the water, and his sister watched over him. Or it might be he had a really bad temper. Moses had a very bad temper. He killed a man. He smashed the rock and hit the rock instead of doing what God commanded. He, he had a, a, a very bad temper, and it was only through the grace of God that he controlled it. He also had a few issues with his self-concept. At first, he did not have confidence. But God chose Moses as his representative to lead the children of Israel out of bondage to freedom, out of anxiety and slavery into rest and peace, from Egypt to the promised land. But it was not a journey without difficulty. And the difficulties were brought upon the children of Israel by themselves and in life. We can be a bit like that, can't we? Subconsciously or consciously, we can put up barriers that stop us from enjoying the freedom of God's rest. Moses was obeying the, God, the commandments of God and God said to Moses, put your rod in the water and he promised that there would be escape and you have a, the Red Sea ahead of you. Now, I don't know about you, but today if God said to you, uh, go, go over to Lake Macquarie, you're in bondage, do this and the waters will part and you can walk right through. And incidentally, Lake Macquarie is um, a lake, a huge lake that is very near here, Kurenbong, um, in New South Wales, Australia. It would have taken incredible faith to do as God commanded. It would also have required a certain degree of des desperation because behind were the Egyptian soldiers and they were advancing and they, were, they would have killed the children of Israel. God gave Moses a command and Moses gave the Israelites, the children of Israel, a command and they followed him. I was wondering about that idea of the baptism, being baptised into Moses we're baptised into Christ and this is um, an act, we can refer to it as a ritual, a symbol. It is a rite that we go through as an acknowledgement that we are dying to self and we are buried in Christ and we are resurrected through the grace of God, renewed. It is a symbol it's a symbol of death, it's a symbol of resurrection, it's a symbol of creation and recreation. And so here the children of Israel were baptised into Moses in that they accepted him as their leader. They obeyed his directions, which were God's directions. The alternative was death. And in this relationship, the idea of relational trust was an imperative. And we are shown here through the relationship between the children of Israel and Moses as their leader, we're shown in type the relationship between spiritual Israel and God as our leader. Sometimes we need to have physical concrete experiences to teach us spiritual realities. And this is why it is important to go back. It's one reason it's important to go back and look at the history 
look at the underlying meaning or interpretation of what we read. In addition to this, we find that seeing where they struggled and fell, seeing where the children of Israel struggled and fell, where they took heart again and conquered through the grace of God, we are encouraged and led to press over the obstacles that degenerate nature places in our way. Degenerate nature. Sin. There is this concept called the great controversy. It is the battle between good and evil, between God and Satan. And through all the struggles that we read of in the Bible, we can see behind it that great controversy. And the best way that the power of evil, Satan, can move human beings away from trust in God is to misrepresent his character. To misrepresent his character. God is love. But how is it that a God who is loving could let this happen to the Israelites? I am sure a lot of them must have been asking that question when they were wandering around in the wilderness, when they were suffering despair, when they were focusing on themselves instead of on the God who was their sal salvation. So let's have another look at, in another way at this reality, we're told that what happened with the children of Israel in the um, services and rituals that they had and also in the worship in the tabernacle, that they all these um, activities were to show and to teach them about relationship with God and they were foreshadowing Jesus dying on the cross to save us from sin and the penalty of sin. So here again, we have a, a summary looking at things in slightly different perspective. We have the Egyptian bondage, the Red Sea, the waters that departed, and at last salvation. And we, as we go back to history, tread that path, learning as we go, and the physical journey had strong spiritual dimensions. Now, this brings us to the rituals and the sacrifices, and we again say, how does this link to the idea of longing for more? I'm longing for more understanding of what God's rest really means. And by going back, and in retrospect, with all the biblical information, inspiration that is subsequent to the children of Israel, I can go back and I can look at their experience with enriched understanding because of what God has given in terms not just of ins information but ins inspiration. God uses physical experience and concrete reality, as we said, to develop deeper understanding of spiritual things. Every morning and evening, a lamb of a year old was burnt upon the altar. This every morning and every evening, every day. And this was a reminder to the children of Israel of their constant dependence on God and on the blood which was atoning for sin. I want you to think about that for a moment. Now in 2021, if we brought a lamb down the main aisle of our church and it was slaughtered and it was put on an altar and burnt, what would be the reaction? What would be the reaction of the authorities? What would be the reaction for children who might be watching, people watching? Our history, 
our culture now is very different from the children of Israel. We have the benefit of understanding that they did not have. And going through that concrete experience of having to choose the best lamb. Perhaps it's a lamb that the children had helped nurture. And then the seriousness of bringing that lamb and giving it as a sacrifice would have had a significant impact that would have helped the children of, un, uh, of Israel to understand that sacrifice hurts. Sin hurts. It causes pain. Salvation also hurts. It hurts God because he gave his only begotten son. But there's that overwhelming principle of love and justice. Through the ritual and through the experience of the children of Israel, we can see the cost of love and salvation. Innocence. Innocence is associated with a pure lamb. And Jesus took upon himself the sins of the world. I cannot even begin to understand how abhorrent that must have been for Jesus and for God, for the family watching. I, I, I can't even begin to imagine. But that's what Jesus did for us. That was God gave his only begotten son so that we can have rest and life. This is what I'm longing more for, to avail myself of that rest and that life. How, how can we neglect so great a salvation? Christ is the lamb that was slain. He is both the lamb and the shepherd. And he was slain from the foundation of the world right back into the annals of history, creation. God, the three-in-one, had a plan. And should we, as humans, misuse that perfect gift of choice? He had a plan. In page 143 of the adult lesson, and it's the teacher's uh, version, we find this statement, the entire priesthood, every article of furniture and every service point, they, every service point forward to Christ. They foreshadow Jesus Christ. And you know, when you're a little child, when you're teaching a child, children, at a young age find it very difficult, if not impossible, to think in the world of abstracts. And so we give them concrete things, things they can touch and see and feel and smell and taste so that they can learn and start to understand the underlying concept and what it means. And here the children of Israel were the children of God. And like all children, they needed to have concrete things to touch and see and feel in order to understand the message, the meaning that God was portraying in them. Here we have a foreshadowing of the crucifixion in the Lamb. We have the foreshadowing of the fact that though I am unworthy, Christ's righteousness covers me and I need to go back and look into the history of my childhood as a child of God to be reminded and to understand. So here we have in another way looking at the entire priesthood, 
represented, everything pointed forward to Christ. And the tabernacle in the wilderness was carried with them where they went. Now, in Christ we find an amazingly powerful example of rest. Jesus knew that he was going to die for our sins and yet he was able to rest so peacefully in God's care. One of the secrets was that, and it's not a secret, it's there for all of us to emulate, is that Jesus was in constant contact with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He prayed. Were it not for the upholding of the power of God and the sustaining in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed, if it be thy will, you know, take this cup away, he saw how horrendous it was and it was going to be, but thy will be done. And he was at rest and at peace. There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. For the one who has entered into his rest has also ceased from his own work as God did from his. Therefore, let us study to enter into that rest. And the study includes going back and looking at the process of salvation, the process of learning and developing, the process, the journey, the walk of the children of Israel. You know, history repeats itself and we wonder why there were, were, were so there have been so many wars. Why don't we learn? Why don't we learn? We don't learn because we don't give over to the power of God. Were God in control? If people allowed God to control their minds, there wouldn't be these wars. There wouldn't be the crimes that there are. There would be heaven, a new world, a new creation. And it is resting in the grace of God, isn't it? It's God's grace that gives us rest. What are we longing for more of? God's grace, restorative power, transformative power, change. The ability to choose to hand over to God all our cares. Come unto me, all you who labour and are heavy rest, all you who are labour and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Come, take that step into the dry land where the waters are parted, the Red Sea. Take that step of faith. Hand over your life to me and I will give you rest, the never-ending kind. Rest is found when all self-justification all reasoning from a selfish standpoint is put away. And we can only do that through Jesus, through the power of God, God the Father, the Son, and through the moving of the Holy Spirit. Entire self-surrender and acceptance of his ways is the secret of perfect rest in his, in his love. I've got loves there, plural should be love singular but I loves will do me fine all the loves that God gives to us and that he showers us with so we've seen how the children of Israel walked their walk in terms of taking that step of faith going into the the dry path but being surrounded by the waters there's there many songs that I think of when, when I'm studying the word of God. You know, he puts the words of, of hymns into your mind. Nearer, still nearer, close to your heart. Draw me, my saviour, 
so precious thou art. We can only really come to him if we surrender, if we surrender the control that we seek and hand over to God. The entire history of Israel is an example of our Christian walk with God. The entire history of Israel is an example of our Christian walk with God. If we want to understand the walking, the labour and the rest, the salvation, we need to go back, back. Even before the children of Israel, we need to go back to the seven days of creation. Here is the, the readings that we are having here are like promises. We have the biblical promises. Hold fast to the promises of God. There are so many. And what he says, he will do. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. It may be wait upon the Lord. And when the time is right, he fulfills his promises. To obtain rest for the soul and peace that passes understanding, God requires unquestioning obedience. Obey. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They obey. And we find this right at the end of the Bible in Revelation. Obeying, handing over. And remember, Obedience requires strong relational trust. I trust God because he has shown me that he keeps his word and that he loves me. And here we talk about disobedience, hardening the heart and conscience of the guilty one, but it tends to corrupt the faith of others as well. There is no more powerful witness than a Christian who activates their faith. There is no more corrupt Christian than one who says one thing but does another, who maintains that they have the truth, that they live in the way God wants them to, but in their actions, they are denying the power and the character of God. We know that the Sabbath is God's rest. God doesn't ask us to do things or to keep things without a very good reason. You know, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt they labor, shalt they, shalt they labor, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and in it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, thy daughter. And so it goes on. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It is a day of rest. It is a day of relational trust, developing relational trust with God. So longing for more, longing for more, how does that fit with the content of this week's lesson? Longing for more means that we know and understand our need of the salvation of Jesus Christ. We need to be completed. We need to be finished. And there are three finishes that I would like to finish on. And they, they comprise really our spiritual journey, the beginning, the middle, and the end. And this journey is a journey that leads to eternal rest, to eternal life with God. Oh, and I'm longing for that time. Our world cannot 
support itself. Our environment can't be sustained. Jesus is coming soon. The Bible says so. The signs say so. Jesus himself says so. And here are those three times of finishing. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day. The beginning. On the cross Jesus said it is finished. The debt is paid in full. Rest, my child. And in Revelation 21, verse 6, it is finished, says Jesus as he comes. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It is time for rest. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, nor there shall be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. The beginning, the middle, and the end. We long for rest. We long for the finish, for the completion, so that we can rest, that we can live, we can talk with God. We can understand and learn more about God and about our lives, who we are, and whose we are. Longing for more? Come unto me, said Jesus, and I will give you rest. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the word in its written form and for Jesus, the word, the bread of life, the water of life. Oh, how long, dear Jesus, is it before you come? We are longing for rest. And I pray that you will sustain us. Please, whenever is required, help us to be able to share what we know and what we believe through the lives that we live. Thank you for your gift of rest. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, it is my privilege to welcome everyone to our Sabbath time this morning, to our worship service. And I pray that as we contemplate our worship time, that we will be blessed by God's Spirit at this time. I'd like to welcome those who are tuning in, maybe for the first time. Uh, That's one of the benefits of having our service online, that we can have anyone, anywhere in the world, tune into our service. And I pray that uh, those who are tuning in will be blessed by our service today. By way of reading, and those of you who maybe are aware that this week our church has been having our week of prayer. And our week of prayer has been on the three angels' messages. And I thought this week, just as part of our service, that I would read the three angels' messages from Revelation 14. And so... This is Revelation 14, of course, starting in verse 6. And many of you will know this, it's very familiar, but I'd like to read it just to reiterate the blessing in this passage of Scripture. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water and there followed another angel saying babylon is fallen is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Just some housekeeping that uh, we need to keep in mind is that uh, we had some transfers, both in and out, just a few weeks ago, and those transfers in were Graham and Merrill Smith and uh, Julie uh, Sumeranadak. Uh, they have welcomed those into our church here at Avondale Memorial. And sadly, we've lost a few people as well. Alan Craig and uh, Christopher and Oleen Twine have uh, chosen to move on to another another church. May you be blessed as you worship with us today, is my prayer. Amen. Well, good morning. I hope you're doing well wherever you find yourself today and this morning. I hope that you are having a uh, a very blessed uh, Sabbath. A few things that uh, I want to share with you on behalf of the pastoral team in our ministry focus segment, and that is that uh, as of Monday, that's this coming Monday, we will be accepting your offerings again in the uh, church office. The uh, office is actually closed and will remain closed over the next few weeks. However, there is a letterbox uh, slot in the breezeway. And so if you um, arrive between 9 and 5, so business hours, you can put your offering into that letterbox slot and it will be accepted. I know a few people have been asking um, when they will be able to bring their offering. So as of this Monday you can start to bring your offerings again uh, just in the letterbox slot in the breezeway from 9 to 5. Also, uh, as a pastoral team, we spend uh, the morning together and we pray for our members. So we think about you, we pray for you, and we're working our way through the church role. So uh, when we do pray for you, we will send you something to let you know that we're praying for you. But we're also noticing that some 
details in the church role are incorrect. So if you are a, a member here at the uh, Avondale Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church and uh, you feel that uh, you haven't been receiving correspondence or would like to receive some correspondence, uh, or maybe you've moved and you haven't updated your details, uh, if you could contact Nina by email or if you want to call one of the pastors, either Pastor Nimrod or myself or Stephen, uh, we'll be happy to take your details and we'll um, update those details on the church role. Third, we, uh, as was mentioned by Paul, thank you very much, Paul, we've been having our week of prayer. And last night, we had 77 people on Zoom. It's been a really good meeting. Uh, on average, we've had 73 people per night on Zoom. And we've had a really good time together, enjoyed our time together uh, as we're covering Revelation chapter 14. Uh, the three angels' message is there. Tonight is the final week of prayer meeting, and that is at 5.30 tonight. So jump on. All the details are in the bulletin and in the pastor's letter. Two more things, or three more things, and then I'll, I'll um, pass it over to, this, uh, to these beautiful ladies. The Plus One Youth series is continuing. Uh, today, Nathaniel Ginn is preaching in Plus One for the youth series on Ecclesiastes, so keep them and the young people in your prayers. Today is also the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Uh, it was 20 years ago that those uh, horrific and tragic events of the, uh, uh, the, the Twin Towers and the terrorist attacks in uh, the US uh, um, occurred, and we just want to... Um, just let you know that as a partial team and as a church, we are praying for all of those people who lost loved ones during that time. Um, it was quite a horrific and uh, quite a tragic event. And our thoughts and prayers go out to everyone. Uh, on these anniversary days like this, people remember these things and it can be quite emotional. Um, so please, if, um, if you know someone who maybe lost a loved one, Make sure that they're okay. Reach out to them, see how they're doing, and, and have a prayer with them. Finally, you, if you've been watching the news, uh, this week a new COVID roadmap was uh, released and uh, we've been told that here in New South Wales um, we will be able to return to some sort of normal life um, when 70% of the population have received their second um, jab, their second vaccination. Uh, at the moment, things are, are certainly heading in that way, and um, the New South Wales government and uh, the health department are hoping by October that uh, we can return to, to life as it was before COVID or, or pre, um, you know, this lockdown anyway. As a pastoral team, these are, you know, this affects us as a church as well and as a pastoral team because we can't worship here. And um, what, that, what that will look like in the future, we don't know. At the moment uh, and in this coming week, our conference and leaders in our conference and leaders in the uh, Australian Union Conference will be meeting and they will be discussing these issues and, and how... As a church, we move forward uh, with this COVID roadmap and what we need to do to ensure that our congregations and, and uh, all of us can return to worshiping together publicly. Um, as a partial team, we are not fearful of this situation and what's happening. Uh, we want to assure you that we as pastors are not afraid to have the difficult discussions that need to be had about COVID. We, we sit down, we pray about this and we talk about it and uh, as a partial team, we are not afraid. Um, we are very confident of God's leading during this time and into the future and we, we will continue to trust Him. We also believe and as a conference and as a worldwide church 
Uh, we believe that this is a health issue, and I just want to clarify that again, that this is a health issue. As a church, we don't have a problem with vaccines and vaccinations. Uh, we've been uh, very supportive of vaccinations for, well, from our very inception as a church. So we don't have a problem with that officially as a church. This is a, glo a global pandemic. This is a health issue. And um, while uh, this is not a spiritual issue, it's not the mark of the beast, we as a pastoral team also understand and know our Adventist and biblical eschatology. We know what we believe regarding end time events. We have not done a backflip on that. We want to assure you of that. Uh, we are very confident in our understanding of biblical eschatology and end time events. Um, so we're not fearful of this. If you want to have a chat with us, please come chat with Pastor Nimrod, myself or Stephen. We're happy to sit with you and chat with you and work through some of these issues as you try to navigate what is best and what should be done during this time. But we just wanted to let you know that we're on top of this and uh, we will continue to talk to you and with our leaders about this um, so that we can make sure that we're doing the right thing. That's enough from me. I took up enough time. God bless you. Have a happy Sabbath and thank you very much. Good morning. Our thanks today goes to our Saviour and our Redeemer as we worship Him. He is our Messiah, our King, the Holy One, and he came to save us. Join us if you're at home and sing along there with us. faithful. He is unchanging. He is compassionate and he is merciful. He gives us strength for each day as we need it. How great is his faithfulness to us all.
it has now come time for us to have our prayer. Now I'm going to combine our main prayer with our prayer for our offering. Our offering this week is for the annual sacrifice. Now for those of you who may not know what that is, it's an initiative of the General Conference to ensure that the gospel of salvation gets preached in some really remote areas of the world. And so the money that you give this week will go towards the gospel going to possibly areas where it's never been before. And that's a great thought, isn't it? Now, you can give several ways, as Steve has just explained. We can now give the church again, but also we can give through e-giving. And so if you are able to do that, I suggest you get online and uh, you can go to our church conference website or just Google e-giving and you'll soon get to a place where you can certainly submit some funds to support our church here. If you're able, I would like to you, for you to invite you to kneel with me as we pray at this time. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we have this privilege of prayer, for we can petition you at any time, for we can recognise your sovereignty, we can recognise your creatorship, and we can also, uh, also recognise your recreatorship that you long to do in your people. Lord, we're thankful that it is Sabbath, that we can rest. We're thankful that the sun is shining. We're thankful that it is spring and we can see the spring flowers. And we're thankful too, Lord, that we acknowledge you as the one who is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Lord, today you know our world is in conflict. You know our world is troubled. You know our world is having many trials through this COVID virus. Lord, we see people dying and suffering. And Lord, we just pray for your care, your protection upon our church, upon our community and upon our country here. We just pray, Lord, that you will guide and protect people. Lord, others within our church and community are suffering through other ailments. Lord, we just pray that you'll be close to them. We pray also, Lord, that you will uh, be with those who've lost someone close. And maybe those who are discouraged, Lord, we just pray that you will encourage people to spend time in your word, to seek their saviour, to know him more fully. Father, we are thankful that you still provide us with the means to live. And we pray today, Lord, that as we give our offerings for the annual sacrifice, that you will bless these offerings. And Lord, those that administer it, that they may be directed by your spirit to put these offerings in areas where the gospel hasn't been preached. And Lord, may your spirit go to those areas and Lord, may we see a response, may we see people saved in your kingdom. Lord, today we just pray for Pastor Nimrod as he preaches to us, Lord, as he has to fill in at the last minute. We just pray you'll be especially close to him. And we ask that you continue to bless everyone who's been part of our program here today. Lord, we are thankful that we can serve you in a small way. Lord, we just acknowledge Jesus again as the one who has provided salvation for us all. And we pray, Lord, that you will keep us faithful. You will help us to be lights in this dark world so that we may hasten his return, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. For our story time this morning, I remembered back to when I was 10 years old. I lived in Albany in Western Australia and with a group of young children from my church, we for the first time got on a train. I was feeling very grown up. I had not been away on an adventure without my parents before. We did have one of our Sabbath school leaders with us and a whole group. We were so excited. It was a fairly long train trip. It took quite a few hours, but our enthusiasm could not have been more. I remember getting to junior camp and we were put into a cabin and there we um, had lots of fun. 
one of the things we had to do was keep our cabin tidy. Now anyone who knows me knows me will know that that's not have been really hard to do. I liked to keep things tidy. Moreover, there was a competition to see whose cabin could be tidy every day and a reward was given at the end and I was out for that reward. Today our story is about a boy named Martin. He too used to go on the train with his mum and dad every month to visit his grandmother. One day when he got home he said, next time we go can I please go on my own? Now he was only nine years old. I know as a mother and a grandmother I would think twice about letting my nine-year-old get on a train and go a longer distance all on their own. But mum and dad had a little word together and they went up to him because they didn't want to crush him and so they said yep okay that'll be fine no problem. So they took him to the station and they put him on the train and off the train went. They said goodbye and Martin got seated into his um, seat. But just before he left, you know what mums and dads are like? They like to make sure that you're going to be okay. So his dad said, now I know you're going to be okay and he said, if you get scared or if you're unsure, I've just, I've put something in your pocket, that's for you. Martin didn't pay a lot of attention at the time but he sat down in his seat and as the train pulled away he was feeling so excited. He was looking out the window at the scenery and he watched all the people on the train getting on and getting off. At one station though a big group of younger people got on. They were very rowdy and they, people kept looking and thinking who is this little boy on his own? Where are his parents? And people he could hear them talking and he started to get a little bit uneasy. He wasn't that uneasy but when these big kids started sort of making a lot of noise and almost getting pushy at him he started to get a little bit scared so much so that he sat there put his head down and the tears just started to fall. He was feeling very scared. He didn't know what to do next. Suddenly he remembered put his hand in his pocket and pulled out what dad had put in there. It was a note. He opened it up and it read, Son, I'm in the car behind you. I can see you. Well, as you can imagine, Martin felt so much better knowing that someone was watching over him. Like Martin, when things in this life make us scared or concerned, we can be assured that Jesus is watching us. He's in the car behind us where he can keep an eye on us too. I can't wait to get to heaven and talk with Jesus and my guardian angel to find out all the circumstances that they were there to guide me and help me through life and all the times that I was delivered or saved from danger and I didn't know about it. Just remember, we can trust that Jesus is watching over us all the time and he loves us. Thank you.
Thank you, David, for sharing your gift with us this morning. You don't need to try to fix your TV screens. I know I do not look like a Kira, but on Thursday night after prayer meeting, I received a call from Kira that one of the sites that was a COVID exposure site in Morissette, she had visited in the time that was posted. And so to speak to her character and her integrity, she called me and informed me of that. And she went for a COVID test on Friday morning and we were waiting for her results to return. And so our plan was for me to prepare something and give her till 9 a.m. this morning to see if she would receive a text message from New South Wales Health, giving her the clearance to which she would have preached today. But she didn't receive a text message as yet, and so therefore I've stepped in. So she is disappointed. We were looking forward to her sermon. She's worked hard on it. But rest assured, we will reschedule Kira, and she will be able to share that message that God has placed on her heart with our church here at Memorial. The message that I have for you today, I've entitled, Who is your covenant friend? Who is your covenant friend? Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, Jesus, your mighty Son and eternal Spirit, we thank you for your Sabbath. We thank you that even during lockdown, we can still create an atmosphere of worship for your people. And we pray that the little that we bring here today, we know that in your hands will be much. So Father, as we look into your word, we pray that your spirit will move in a mighty way. And so therefore we ask that you will lead us and guide us and walk before us. And may we choose to follow you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. As Christians, we believe that all of the Bible was authored by God, written by men as they were led by the Holy Spirit. All of the Bible was authored by God, written by men as they were led by the Holy Spirit. So we believe that the author of the Bible is the Holy Spirit. So therefore, there cannot be any insignificant detail that's recorded in Scripture because it's authored by the Spirit. So I want you to come with me to Psalm 16, and I'll have it on the screen, all the text for today, because we're going to be looking at several of them. Normally I just sit in one passage, and we just dive to different levels that Scriptures allows us to. But today we're going to journey through many Scriptures, but I will have them on the screen. So the first one is Psalm 16, verses 1 and 2. And so in Psalm 16, verses 1 and 2, it reads this, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good part, I have no good apart from you. Now there's three names of God that we encounter in this text. And the three names that we see here is God, we see Lord that we find in all capital letters, and then we also find the word Lord with capital L and then lowercase O R D. So in the translation, it would be translated as God is Elohim in the Hebrew. The Lord with all capital letters is Yahweh, which is written as Y-H-W-H. And Lord with the lower capital, with the lower letters of O-R-D would be translated in Hebrew as Adonai. Adonai simply means master or, or leader. So you can see that in this text, we encounter all three names. Now, Jacinius notes in his lexicon that the Jewish translators were so afraid of God's divine name that they refused to, to speak it and they refused to translate it. And so God's divine name is the Lord in all capital letters, which is known as Yahweh. And so they translated Lord as Lord with the capital L and lowercase O-R-D. So in scripture, where they would have you know, called God by his divine name, they called him Adonai. One rabbinic source notes that the Jewish translators would wash themselves every time they translated the word Yahweh, God's divine name. 
They washed themselves every time they encountered this name. In the Old Testament, this name pops up, depending on the translation you're looking at, pops up over six and a half thousand times. So these brothers were some of the cleanest people on earth, having to wash themselves every time they translated the name Yahweh. The Bible Project, they bring to light that ancient Jewish translators wanted to prevent people from accidentally saying God's divine name, which is Yahweh, and so they, they kind of came up with a blend of Yahweh and Adonai. So they took the name Yahweh and they took the vows from Adonai and they brought it together, which created the name Yahweh, which is not a word in Hebrew. And so the whole purpose of Yahweh was that when they saw this made-up name, it was a visual reminder to them to not pronounce or even speak the divine name of God, which is Yahweh. Now, before we ridicule these Jewish translators, the English translators were no different. Rather than translating Yahweh as Yahweh in the English translation, we translated it as Lord in all capital letters, which is why some cases you can read Lord, Lord, because they were so afraid of translating it as Yahweh. Some English translators, they took this word Yahweh, which doesn't mean anything in Hebrew, and they translated it as Jehovah or Yehovah, which still stands today. Now, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament was written in Greek. And the Hebrew language is a pictorial language and it, it, is, it has a very limited vocabulary. It's not as precise as the Greek language, and so, but there's pictures for the names of God. And so God, Elohim, the picture is hand. Elohim is the hand of God, which as you read scripture, the hand of God represents God in his judgment, God in his creation, and God in his governance. So whenever you read God, G-O-D in the Bible, it's translated in Hebrew as Elohim, and generally it's in the context of God and his judgment, governance, and to do with his creation. The word Yahweh is God's divine name, and the picture in the Hebrew for God's divine name is heart, the heart. Yahweh is the protector of people. Yahweh is grace. Yahweh is the covenant friend to all believers. Well, let's look at our scripture and how the Holy Spirit very carefully details and authors the names of God in the Bible. In Genesis 1, we see that in the creation account, the name that the Holy Spirit records is Elohim throughout the whole account. Elohim created in verse 1. Elohim said in verse 3. Elohim saw in verse 4, separated verse 4, Elohim called in verse 5, and Elohim made in verse 7. The Holy Spirit records Elohim because that's the hand of God, God in his judiciary, God in his creation, and God in his governance. But something very interesting happens when we get to Genesis chapter 2, verses 4. The text reads, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Here we encounter for the very first time this construct of Lord God in the Bible. Now we're going to encounter this, this, this construct throughout the Old Testament, Lord God, but the thing that I want to point out here is that never does the Holy Spirit record God Lord. It is always Lord God. It is always Yahweh, Elohim, never Elohim, Yahweh. It is never the hand of God first and then followed by the heart of God. The scripture records always the heart of God first and then the hand of God. What can we deduce from this? Yes, Elohim must judge. God must judge the hand. But the emphasis of the Bible is on the heart of God which is Yahweh, which represents grace, salvation, and redemption. You see, unless we point people to the good news of Yahweh's grace, people will not be able to bear the reality of Elohim's judgment. And so let's have a look at how the Holy Spirit directs the names of God throughout Scripture. In Genesis chapter 6, 8, here is the first time we encounter the word grace. So the word favor in this text is translated as grace. And notice that the first time grace appears in our Bibles, it's associated with our covenant friend, Yahweh. 
The text reads, but Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. So Yahweh is associated with grace. When we move to Genesis chapter 7, verses 16, we see how the Holy Spirit carefully details the names of God. And those that entered male and female of all flesh went in as Elohim had commanded him, and the Yahweh shut him in. Notice the text. When it's directing the creation, the animals two by two, it's Elohim, the hand of God. God in his creation directs those animals to go into the ark. But when it comes to us as humans, as Genesis 2, 4, the first time we're introduced to Lord God is in the context of us being created. So when it's got to do with us, the Holy Spirit records, Yahweh shuts us safe in the ark. The Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture, so therefore there is no insignificant detail recorded for us. As we move to Genesis chapter 15, again we will see how the Holy Spirit maneuvers the names of God. Verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 15, the Word of God reads, After these things, the Word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Here, Abram doesn't even use the divine name of God. It's capital L, lowercase o-r-d. So he calls God Adonai Elohim, which is Master God. And so in verse 5 it reads, And he brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. So Abraham is concerned because he is childless. And back in this day, if you were barren, it was, it was, a, it was a negative mark on you. And so he takes his petition to God, and God says to him, I want you to go outside, and I want you to look up to the stars, and I want you to number them. As we read this in our English translations, and what we understand of Abram, we, we naturally conclude that God has asked him to go count the stars, which is impossible, because Abram will become the father of many nations. But this is not what's happening here in this case. In Psalm 19, verses 1, the text reads, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. The word declare in Psalm 19, 1, is the same word here in Genesis 15 for number. And so the culture of this time, what God is asking Abraham to do, is God says, Abraham, I know you're feeling down and you're, you're feeling a bit that I've left you because you're childless, but come outside Look up to the heavens and count the stars, number the stars. And what God was asking Abraham to do was to look up to the stars and to recount the glories of God, to recount the goodness of God, to recount the faithfulness of God that has happened in your past. And so Abraham listens. He goes out and he looks up to the skies and he recounts the goodness of of God. And so then when he refers to God as Adonai um, Elohim, now after he's recounted the skies, he comes back in verse 7 and he believed the Lord, which is Yahweh, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Now he refers to his God in his divine name as Yahweh, our covenant friend. We get to this story in Second Chronicles chapter 18, verses 28 to 34. And King Ahab is a very bad man. He's a bad king, and he has trouble, and he's about to go to war. The other king is King Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat sticks his nose in a business that he, he had no business going to fight this battle, but he, he, he goes. And I don't know about you, if you've ever fallen into that trap where you stick your nose into somebody else's business. I hope that that's not you. But this is what Jehoshaphat does. And so he sticks his nose into King Ahab's business and they're planning together to go to war and to go to battle. Now, before they get to battle, King Ahab says to Jehoshaphat, look, when we get to battle, I'm going to disguise myself, but why don't you wear your kingly robes? And Jehoshaphat foolishly wears his kingly robes into this battle. 
that's got nothing to do with him. And so when you stick your nose in other people's business, let's, let's have a look at what the text says about Jehoshaphat. Second Chronicles 18 verses 31 reads, As soon as the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, It is the king of Israel. So Jehoshaphat is now trapped. He is surrounded by enemy forces, but the enemy forces, because he's wearing his kingly robes, think that that is the king Ahab. But it's King Jehoshaphat, and he's surrounded, and he's facing imminent death. But let's continue on with the text. So they turned to fight him, and Jehoshaphat cried out, and Yahweh helped him, but Elohim drew him away. Yahweh helped him, but Elohim drew them away from him. How did God save him in that moment, surrounded by trained soldiers, thinking Jehoshaphat was Ahab. I like watching movies about real life stories and I love war documentaries and I was watching a documentary uh, on the Gulf War with my, with my kids and my wife and there was one story that really caught our attention and the story has it that they came up, there was a section, there was great resistance that they could not break through. And they tried many attempts to break through this resistance, but they failed at every time. And so what they did was they came up with a plan, which was they would then go at night time to go around the back and come up behind enemy, uh, enemy lines, and then hopefully they could overcome the resistance that they had struggled against. The only trouble with this plan was that to go at night time across the sand dunes uh, sand dunes was a suicide mission because the sand dunes were riddled with landmines. But the officers, the soldiers were called upon and as they do, they obeyed and off they marched to execute the plans. As they made their way out one night and they're on the sand dunes trying to navigate their way across a landmine riddled sand dunes, a big sandstorm takes over them so much so that they had to hunker down, pitch up their tents and just ride the storm out until it finished before they could progress forward. Well, this storm went all night. It didn't finish till the early morning. And so when the sun had risen and then they could get up, they packed up their, their camp and as they made their way to go continue on their mission, to their surprise, the sandstorm had revealed all the landmines in front of them and they were able to make a, a safe cross over the sand dunes and get behind enemy lines and they did eventually break down that resistance. I mean, when I saw that, I thought, what a cool story. I don't know how God saved Jehoshaphat in that moment, how if God created a sandstorm or a sand dust, covered him up and then removed him. I don't know, but I cannot wait to get to heaven and ask God for some of these stories to show us just how he brought rescue upon them. But the text said he called upon Yahweh and Elohim brought him to safety. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 45 to 47, we're going to read just how intimate David was with God. Because David here details God in his divine name, Yahweh, and yet David was this guy that committed adultery. He was a murderer. We know that his leadership in his family was terrible, that it passed down through to his kids. We know that, you know, that he was just, he did a lot of, a lot of sin as a king of, of God's people, but yet God concluded that he was a man after God's own heart because he had an intimate connection with God. And so the text reads here that, then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of Yahweh, the God of the armies and Israel, whom you have defied. This is the day Yahweh will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is God, there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that Yahweh saves, not with a sword and spear, 
For the battle is Yahweh's, and he will give you into our hand. I can understand why God concluded that this man, as much sin as he had in his life, was a man after God's own heart. Because of the way that he connected to God's divine name. And we know the story that he defeated the giant Goliath and he does cut Goliath's head off. And we read this in 1754 where it says, And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. So not only does he defeat the giant, but he he takes his head off and he takes the head to Jerusalem. Now the Valley of Elah where this battle took place, I used to think it was in Jerusalem, but it's not. When I was there in, in um, standing at the ground, it's, it's quite a long way away from Jerusalem. Now, David takes the head of Goliath all the way to Jerusalem. Now, this next part that I'm about to share, we don't find from the Bible, but we get this next information from rabbinic literature, and it's this. It informs us that David took the head of Goliath and buried it outside the city gates of Jerusalem, on a hill, and he buried the head there, and the place was called Gal Goliath. Now we know that later on, that place Gal Goliath would become Gal Gotha, which would be called the place of a skull, and we can read that in John chapter 19, 17. So David takes the head back to Jerusalem, places it outside the city gates on a hill, buries it. It's called Gal Gotha. Years later, it becomes known as. Um, Gal Goliath, and then it becomes known as Golgotha, the place of a skull. Now, a thousand years after King David, one of his descendants would find himself on the same hill, and his name is Jesus. But Jesus, on this same hill, will be crucified on a cross at Golgotha. But while it's a gruesome scene, it's actually a scene of hope. Because in Genesis chapter 3, verses 15, there was a prophecy that said that a woman's offspring shall bruise your head, which is Satan's head, crush his head. And right here on Golgotha is Jesus on a cross, crushing the head of the enemy, Satan. A thousand years before, when his descendant, King David, took the head of Goliath, and then a thousand years later, his descendant, Jesus, crushes the head of the enemy, Satan. I've shared many times that I have five beautiful children and, you know, every time that they are born, you just feel an immense amount of joy and you look at them and you you appreciate them when they're young and and with the the time of social media, I would post photos of as, as they were growing and one of the things I would like to say about my kids is that I would say they are my heart in human form and they're so endearing. It's a, it changes when they grow up, but, uh, but when they're young, they're so beautiful, they're gorgeous, and as you watch them develop, I just can't help but feel so much joy, so much adoration that God allows me to be able to create like this, and it's such a privilege to be a father. But these kids of mine, five of them, all of them, are my, are my heart in human form. When Jesus is on Golgotha, there is an inscription that is written above his head. And the, ins- the inscription reads, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now in John 19, we can read that the chief priests at this time are upset with this inscription above Jesus' head. So in John 19, they go and they approach Pilate and they say to Pilate, you must change this inscription that you've placed on top of his head. You should write, he says that he is the king of the Jews. But Pilate wasn't having anything to do with it. He left it. He left it as is, which read, Jesus um, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. What could be so upsetting to the chief priests at an inscription above Jesus? I mean, they've got what they want. They've put him on a cross He's about to die. Why would they be so upset at an inscription above his head? I would like to submit to you that this inscription was written in three languages. 
And in one of the languages, I believe, is what triggered their, their, their emotion to want to change the sign. Because Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, in Aramaic reads, Yeshua Hanasari Vabmelech Halahudim. And what that means is, it actually makes an acrostic of, guess what? Yahweh. Y H W H. Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is your covenant friend. Jesus is the source of grace. He is the pathway to salvation. He is the source of your forgiveness. Jesus is not only the object of your faith, but he is your personal redeemer and friend. He was not only the covenant friend to believers past, but he is the covenant friend to believers today. At the cross, the heart of God and the hand of God came together. Grace, mercy, love met the wrath of God. But the emphasis of Scripture is not on the hand of God. It is on the heart of God, His mercy, His love, His grace. And it's in this picture of Jesus on a cross who is God's heart in human form. My big idea for you today to sum up this message is that if you are somebody that has Confess your sins before God. You have asked him for forgiveness and you have surrendered your life to him. Then Jesus is your covenant friend. And my big idea is this. With Yahweh as your covenant friend, you never have to fear the judgment of Elohim. With Yahweh as your covenant friend, you never have to fear the judgment of Elohim. I pray that this message will encourage your heart and I pray that God will keep you and bless you and may we always be kind. God bless.
Let us pray. Gracious Father, loving Father in heaven, Jesus, your mighty Son and eternal Spirit. Father, I know you must judge, for you have to vindicate yourself to show the world that you are truly loving and just. But I pray that you will pour out your Spirit on your church to give us the courage and wisdom to lead people to your covenant friend and your Son, Jesus Christ. That as they learn of the salvation and grace and mercies that's found in Jesus, they will have an understanding in why you must judge. So Lord, I pray that you will keep your people and bless them. Prepare them for the week ahead, I pray. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen.